Outer Baptist Church of Brooks and Idaho. All I got was one amen. amen. Thank you, Adrian. Where, where are you, Adrian? There you go. Thank you. I'm glad you do. It's a little, little quiet in here. Amen. Uh, pulled into the parking lot here. Well, the whole camp saw all these cars, and we have camp here. And then I came in here and saw all these people and all the people out there, and I thought words from a wise man once said, I think we're going to need a bigger boat. <laughs> uh, you be in prayer. If you don't know what that reference is to, then you're spiritual and all the people that laugh are carnal. Amen. But, uh, um, man, what a blessing. Uh, what a blessing because some of his crowd hasn't even come yet. And, uh, I mean, I remember doing this at the church for the last however many years we've been here. And uh, it just, you know, you always have some spots to sit here and there and then come around 5 o'clock after the, uh, the supper time or right around the supper time, his people that were coming in out of work and whatnot. And maybe today's a little bit different because of Columbus Day. Or Indigenous Peoples Day, excuse me, let me get that right. Um, so that's for Adrian. <coughs> but, um, but uh, you know, it's, uh, it is great to see all these people here. Uh, be in prayer for us. We just took on an assistant pastor, Caleb Stedman. You can have him back. Amen. I'm joking. His brother, his family here, and his dad's here, and he is a real blessing. And uh, just pray for our church. It's a little bit of a new, new beginning. We're in the, I'm in the eighth year, a couple days, eighth year of being a pastor there at Stillwaters Baptist Church. And uh, so bringing on an assistant is just a blessing, and we'll see what the Lord's going to do. I'm excited. Grab your Bible, turn to the book of Judges, chapter 13. I'm going to talk about a very familiar person in the Bible. And uh, this guy is somebody that I think we all admire from a distance, especially when you talk to your kids. That would be Samson, right? Uh, somehow he made it into the Hall of Faith. Uh, somehow he's one of these guys that we're supposed to aspire to be, yet we warn our children about him. And as soon as I, I asked uh, Caleb Stedman, I said, what do you think about when you think of Samson? And he goes, he hung his head and he went, Delilah. He said, exactly, exactly. When we think of Samson, we don't think, we, we, we preach it with this thought of, uh, he's a great hero of the faith, but at the same time, children, men especially, do not follow what he did. And uh, I'll be honest with you, I've preached this passage through, there's a variety of ways you can preach it. You can teach, preach through the Nazarite vow, you can preach it from the, uh, the faults of Samson. And uh, uh, I, every time I come to this passage of scripture about Samson, there's just this uneasiness with the first thought that we all have about him. How was he the way he was and yet a man of faith? And uh, I was actually supposed to preach this, or I was going, not supposed to, because I don't know if Pastor Bryant was going to even have me preach in, in April, but, uh, or May, but um, this was a message I was going to preach there, and, and just kind of feel the peace to preach it here. It is geared towards pastors, but at the same time, I believe it's something that you and I, if you're not in the ministry, or, or, or a pastoral ministry as we hear today, we heard you're in the ministry, but uh, maybe it'll be a help to you somehow. So I think this is especially towards pastors, verse 24 and 25 of Judges chapter 13, jump right into it. It says, And the woman bare a son, and called his name Samson, Judges 13, 24. And the child grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Eshtal. Uh, I think we could understand, when you look at the life of Samson, that God moved him. Moved him so much that he found himself in Hebrews chapter 11, I think it is verse 35, uh, as, uh, or verse 32, as a hero of the faith. So there are some things about Samson that we can learn, but there's always, there's the obvious flaw about Samson that is a scary thought. Samson had an eye for women. All right, that's the thought that we have. Correct? Look what it says, verse 14. And Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. I'm not just making that up. The Bible says it, Right? Uh, in fact, when you look at the life of Samson, look at verse 3, this is not the first time that he was attracted to somebody of the opposite gender, which is the way we wanted, amen? But on the wrong side. Look what his parents say. Then his father and his mother said unto him, Is there, what's the next word? Never, Never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren, or among all thy, my people. Now this is not a message about men and women and being pure, although this is a, you know, that's the underlying thing that you're going to right away. But we can see right away from Samson, he has an eye for a woman, and it is not the woman that we would say would be for our child, right? All right, two of you. Praise the Lord. At least I got two on board. Look at chapter 16. Chapter 16. 
We would, we would say this about Samson, that he is an obvious womanizer. Verse 1 of chapter 16, Then went Samson to Gaza, or Gaza, or however you say it, and saw there an harlot, and went unto her. We see these are obvious signs, and this is the red flag flapping in the breeze very high about Samson. This is the thing that when you think of Samson, you go, what an amazing ability and spirit of the Lord, but yet there is this huge red flag that even though he's done all these other things, these things will never be washed away. And according to, according to the book of Proverbs chapter 6, they never can be. His reproach will always lie upon him. Verse 4, And it came to pass afterward that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. So we see that Samson's weakness becomes the obvious downfall of his ministry, if I could, this morning. But I want to give you some thoughts here that maybe debunk the notion that Samson was a womanizer. I am not on the side of what Samson did, and neither should you be. But I also want to take a hero of the faith and build them back up to being what they were, a hero of the faith. And maybe show you there might be a reason why he did what he did and how close all of us could be, especially men in the ministry. God, I ask you to help these next few moments as I preach that you would help this message, this thought that you gave me, that it might come across in a way that it might be a help to us. Now, Father, this might be towards anybody in this room. I don't know, but I obviously think of myself in the ministry and other men that are in the ministry here that stand behind a pulpit of wood just like this and preach the gospel. And so, Father, I ask that you please help us to take these thoughts and to apply them if they are applicable to us. And if they're not yet, Lord, help us to put them aside and remember this message as a word of warning. Lord, maybe some foresight that our ministries may continue well past uh, this expiration date that Samson went through. Thank you, God, for the word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let me give you a couple of things that, uh, first, I got two points. Samson, first off, where I don't think that he necessarily had a problem with women. Look back if you would. And uh, we, know, we know the natural state of a man. He likes what he sees. Ladies, you like what you hear. We see this from the garden, right? <laughs> Women like what they hear. Men like what they see. This is kind of the old notion, and we all know that. And obviously, Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman. So men have this natural draw. Women are pretty. You know, my dad always said, you know, that men are the oats and the barley, and women are the sugar and spice and everything nice. If men are sugar and spice and everything nice, I don't want to be around you. Amen? <laughs> I just, you're not my type of guy, <laughs> and I don't want to hang around you. But uh, women, if you're the oats and the barley, the same thing goes for the truth for you. I don't want to hang around you either. I and mean, I don't want my daughters hanging around you. I want feminine, ladylike ladies that are going to teach my younger women to live and be godly women later on. I believe those two genders should be totally different in the way that they approach different situations. And now, obviously, we know that Samson here is, uh, is like every other male that ever was created, that he saw a woman and thought her pretty. Praise the Lord. That is the way that God wanted. I don't know if you know this. This is natural, <laughs> right? But here's why I think that, number one, there's two little things I have thought, thought here. One of the th reasons why I think he was not a womanizer is found in chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. Now, we're going to jump ahead here. We're going to get to the story here. But if you know the story of Samson, and I will break it down for you here as we go through this. It says this, And it came to pass within a while after in the time of wheat harvest that Samson visited his wife with a kid. And we know this by this time he had a Philistine wife. Uh, built his, his wife with a kid and said, I will go into my wife and into the chamber, but her father would not suffer him to go in. And his father said, I verily thought that thou hast utterly hated her, therefore I gave her to thy companion. Is not her younger sister fairer than she? Take her, I pray thee, instead of her. If he was a womanizer, let me tell you, he wouldn't have had a problem with that suggestion. But he didn't do it. From what I know next, he tied a bunch of foxes' tails together and burnt down his enemy's uh, fields. You say, why? He loved his wife. I, this, unfortunately, the pulpit in their sins is magnified much more than the pew in this area. But I have never known a guy that's in the pulpit that's a womanizer to say no to something like this. And Samson said no. So let me give you the first thought is that maybe he was not because he turned this down. All right? Number two is this. We know this for a fact, according to the Bible. That is speculation, what I just said. But we know this for a fact, that the wife that he took was of God. And young people, let me say this, this is a one and done case where it is of God to be unequally yoked. Look at it says, Judges, verse four, chapter 14. 
Verse 3, Then his father and his mother said unto him, Is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren, and among all my people, that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said unto his father, Get her for me, for she pleaseth me well. But his father and his mother knew not that it was what? That's right, it was of the Lord, that he, might, that he sought an occasion against the Philistines, for at that time the Philistines had dominion over Israel. We know this was of God because of what takes place next. God was taking Samson and putting him smack dab right in the center of the Philistine life. He would have never been allowed there, and the Jews would have never allowed him to go. He would have never been allowed back in Judaism or back with those Jews had he lived amongst the Philistines, but now he is unequally yoked to them, but equally yoked according to God, which is hard for me to say, but this was God's will, to put him right in the center of the Philistines to wreak havoc. And wreak havoc did he do. <laughs> Boy, did he ever. This is similar to what Joseph went through. We would never think that it would be God's will for us to be sold into captivity, but yet God sold him into captivity to spare his own family later on. See, God works in different ways than we do. We see like this, but He sees like this. <laughs> he sees the big picture. We only see this one. We see what's in front of us and maybe around us, but God sees the whole thing. Let's look at the results of this marriage. Look at verse 11. We know the stories here. He went down, and uh, he had himself a, a results of this marriage. He had a feast. He makes a wager here in verse 11 and 12, and it came to pass when they saw him that they brought 30 companions to be with him. Or to be with him. And Samuel, Samson said unto them, I will now put a riddle unto you, if you can certainly declare it me within seven days of the feast and find it out, then will I give you 30 sheets and 30 changes of garments. And you guys know as well as I do, and, and I'm moving fast through this because I don't care if it takes 30, time, 30 minutes, I want you to get the points at the end of this. I'm moving fast because he says this, he, he goes, they go out, you know the riddle was uh, dealing with that lion that he had killed a couple of verses before. He gives this riddle out to them. And he puts forth the riddle in verse 14. And he said unto me, Out of the eater came forth meat, and out of the strong came forth sweetness, and they could not in three days expound the riddle. Now we know exactly what it was. We know it's the honey in the carcass of the dead lion. But because of this riddle, they mess around with his wife, and, and they, they, they uh, um, bully his wife into getting the answer. And so she finally gets the answer, and then they bring him the answer. And now Samson's caught with having to get 30 sheets of, you know, 30 garments for these other 30 guys. Look, if you would, in verse 19, and so what happens? He goes down to Ashkelon, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he went down to Ashkelon and slew 30 men of them and took their spoil and gave change of garments unto them, which expounded the riddle. This would have never happened had he not married that Philistine woman and been put right in the middle of them. You see the way God is working. It gets worse. While he's down there and his anger was kindled, he went up to his father's house. While he's at his father's house fuming about what had just happened, how he had been betrayed and how maybe his wife betrayed him or is bullied and he's fuming about it his wife obviously here in verse 20 was given to his companion whom he had used as his friend we understand what is about to happen in chapter 15 verses 1 through 8 he goes down there to be with his wife and his wife has been given away and he's mad he gets those foxes ties their their tails together with those embers embers and burns down in the fields and it says this in verse 4, And Samson went and caught 300 foxes and took firebrands and turned tail to tail and put a firebrand in the midst between two tails. And when he had set the brands on fire, he let them go into the standing corn of the Philistines and burn up both the shocks and all the standing corn with the vineyards and olives. Now what would you do if somebody did that to you? You'd do exactly what they're about to do. Verse 6, Then the Philistines said, Who hath done this? And they answered, Samson, the son-in-law of the Timnite. Because he had taken his wife and given her to his companion, the Philistines came up and burnt her and her father with fire. And Samson said unto them, Though ye be, ye have done this, yet will I be avenged of you, and after that I will cease. And he smote them hip and thigh with a great slaughter. And he went down and dwelt in the top of the rock of Edom. I don't know how many people died here, but again, we've got a hip and thigh with a great slaughter. The Bible doesn't give us a name. It doesn't give us a number. You say, what happened? Well, he married this lady. <laughs> Right after that happens, 30 Philistines die. See, God's plan was working. Now you've got a bunch of other Philistines that die. It doesn't stop there. He's at the top of this rock. Verse 9, the Philistines went up and pitched in Judah and spread themselves in Lehi. Look at verse 14. And when he came unto Lehi, the Philistines shouted against him, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and the cords that were upon his arm became his flax, and that was burnt with fire and his bands loosed from off his hands and he found a new jawbone of an ass and he put forth his hand now the Bible gives us a number and took it and slew a thousand men therewith 
Now, thousand men. I don't know how long chapter 14 is and chapter 15 is, but the life of 15 is really the life of Samson. And I, right now, and what I would say is this probably all took place within a season. This did not take place within his whole ministry. This took place within a very short time. He goes out there. Uh, he beats up these guys. He kills them. You know what I find is that his ministry was full of hardships and dishonor. Uh, it was brutal. And he slew a bunch of the enemy just the way God wanted it. I don't know about you, but I'm not longing to be in a ministry like that. Not. Now, what I want you to know is what the Lord showed me here at the end of chapter 15. It says, And he judged Israel in the days of the Philistines 20 years. This is the beginning. What this happened, the Lord did to put Samson out in front of the Philistines to show them there's a judge now in Israel that you cannot beat. And then he judges Israel for 20 years. Now, what's the next word in chapter 16? Then, then after how many years? 20 years. 20 years. 20 years. Listen, if chapter 16 would not have been written about Samson, all we would think about is this guy who loved his wife, who had her taken from him, who had her murdered, who then killed a bunch of guys because of it. And all of us would go, he's our hero. Then, after 20 years, he makes these mistakes that obviously were the downfall of his ministry. Then comes the time where we look at him and say he was a womanizer, right? We wouldn't have looked at him as a womanizer for marrying somebody that God brought into his life. It is now in chapter 16 where he goes into a harlot, and then he takes Delilah as a companion, and we look at him and go, well, now, kids, stay away. <laughs> we do not want to be like this guy. It is after 20 years of serving God in his prospective ministry, then he does something. And we see a problem. And I want to give you, I would say it is preacher speculation, but I think it's something that will help me out and I hope it helps you out. I want you to look, you say, look at verse 20 of chapter 15 and then the last verse of chapter 16. Chapter 15, verse 20, And he judged Israel in the days of the Philistines 20 years. And look what it says in the last verse of chapter 16, the last little part. It says he judged Israel 20 years. What that tells me is that what happens here in chapter 16 happens within the 20th year of his ministry. Am I, are you on board with me? You follow me? Something took place after 20 years that he just said, I'm done. Right? His ministry was not limited. There was not an expiration date. You're only going to minister for 20 years and then you're done. No, he ministered for 20 years and then he did something. And it was inwardly before it was outwardly. And it ended his ministry ultimately. Samson, in verse 1, he was into this harlot. Samson did not go into this harlot, I think, because he was a womanizer. Here's what I think. I think, but because the last 20 years, he was lonely. <laughs> you ever get lonely in the ministry? Thank you. One of you. <laughs> and I'm not necessarily talking about this way. We have wives. I could not imagine being in the ministry without that lady right there. I couldn't. I've been in ministry for 18 years. Ten, uh, ten years as an assistant, eight years as a pastor, and I wouldn't want to do one of those years without her. I wouldn't. I couldn't imagine ministering for 20 years without having any friends. I couldn't imagine it. Look at chapter 15. You say, oh, but the Israelites were on his side. Really? Look at chapter 15, verse 9. <laughs> then the Philistines. Remember when Samson sitting at the top of the rock, and in just a few more verses, he's going to beat a thousand of them to death with the jawbone of an ass, but it doesn't just happen like that. There's some verses in between 9 and 14. And the men of Judah, verse 10, said, Why are you come up against us? And the Philistines, and they answered, to bind Samson, are we come up to do to him as he hath done to us? And the 3,000 men of Judah went to the top of the rock, Edom, and said to Samson, Knowest thou not that the Philistines are rulers over us? What is this that thou hast done to us? And he said unto them, As they did unto me, so have I done unto them. They were taking it personally, the Philistines were coming after them. Guess what? Samson was not on their heroes list. 
He was not. Verse 12, And they said unto him, We are come down to bind thee, that we may deliver thee into the hand of the Philistines. And Samson said unto them, Oh, this is, this is fine, guys. This is the will of the Lord. No, you know what he says? There's no trust here. He says, Swear unto me that you will not fall upon me yourselves. And they spake unto him, saying, No, but we will bind thee fast and deliver thee into ha their hand, but surely he, we will not kill thee. And they bound him with two cords and new cords and brought him up from the rock. Can I ask a, a father, any father in this room that's now known the life of Samson for these first few seasons of his first season of his life, which Israelite father, imagine you're that guy, would give his daughter to be his next wife? Any takers? What about a Philistine? Let's just imagine you're one of the Philistines. Any Philistine fathers in here would like to say, oh, my, my daughter to be the next wife of Samson? None of them. He couldn't find anybody. 20 years. Lonely. That's rough. <laughs> he has nobody on his side. Even the God that provided to him in chapter 14, verse 4, a wife that we know of does not provide him one for the next 20 years. That's rough. Look at chapter 16, verse 1. Then, then, after 20 years of being lonely and feeling unappreciated, forgotten, I'm done. Samson went to Gaza and saw there an harlot and went unto her. After 20 years. Kind of a scary thing because the ministry can be very lonely. You can feel very forgotten by God at points. You can feel very underappreciated by even the one who put you in it if you're not careful. And it is at those points when you can do some of the dumbest things that will end your ministry. And it's done. Pastor Christian, uh, Orrin Christian said to me years ago as I was just getting into the ministry, he said, Nathan, he said, the ministry is a thankless job. Now, I thank Pastor Habman for the, the care. He's very careful of this stuff. He's very appreciative of the men. I thank this church and these people. You guys have been taught to be appreciative. My church did a pastor appreciation thing yesterday because it's our month of October, pastor appreciation month. Brought us up front, me and Pastor Stedman, and prayed over us and gave us a gift card and a card and a check. And you say, what was it? I feel appreciated, and I thank God for that. But the scary thing is that then after this, God doesn't judge him right away. He leaves there with the same spirit that he came with, carries the gates for 20 miles, and thinks, I can live this way. I can still minister having done what I'm doing now. <laughs> and then he shacks up with Delilah, and you know the end. You know the end. You know, as a pastor, just like Samson, sometimes I don't fit in with the sheep being a shepherd. And I don't fit in with the world, the heathen being a Christian. Right. And Samson, I think, was tired of being the battering ram for Israel and the punching bag for the Philistines and not having anything to show for it. And he said, I'm done. I'm just going to do this my way. And he messed up. He messed up. Elijah messed up when he began to look around at his ministry and others or no one else and feeling lonely. Ministers must be aware that our occupation is different from those around us. You cannot base it by looking around at others' progress in life. You ever, you ever as a minister, look at your IRA, if you have one? Your 401k? I don't even know what that means. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I've got an investment into Edward Jones. You say, how much has it gone up? Well, this year it's gone down more than it's gone up. <laughs> then it went back up. And I look at it and I go, Lord, you know, how come they look like they're doing just fine? I can start looking around at other things and then all of a sudden blame God and start feeling unappreciated by God and feeling lonely. And I have to be careful about that. Let me give you another thought. Our age bracket in this room is roughly 30 to 60 years old as pastors. It really is. Might be some older, but most of us in this room fall within that third score of our life, are close to it, 40 to 60. 
What I also want to make an observation is, is this. I think that you have to have been in this position for some time to feel this unappreciativeness. Samson was born in 1161, and by the time he dies, it is 1120, he is roughly 40 years old. Roughly 40 years with 20 years under his belt and feeling like he had nothing to show for it. And he messed up. Do you know that Moses was 40 years old when he messed up? And it set him back an equal amount of times. So this is a word warning for us men in this room that are pastors. You're not alone. You're not alone. You are appreciated. You, you don't understand. You do understand when you come to a meeting like this and you see the brethren just pour in. And you see the brothers that you've rubbed shoulders with. And it's just like, thank you, God. Amen. There are others out there who have not bowed the knee. <laughs> and I don't want any of my brethren to pull this Samson thing. Whether with this type or with something else where they just say, maybe they never fall into this sin, but they say, I'm done, I'm gone, I'm just going to go get a job. <laughs> we need you. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have showed toward his name, and that you have ministered to the saints. Do minister. Pastor Hadman.